seven miles in 35 minutes and it left everything on fire at once. The heat's just unbelievable. Man. It's so hot it's melted steel. It is, it is an ember storm. It is blindness, it is choking. Fire is chaos. The place is just ash and rock. And you go in there and look and you just shake your head. Why? We will have everybody in by. A serious concern would be rapid moving fire through the valley. Yeah, and we were given a uh, direction through the delegation of the authority to the incident commander on how to go about managing this incident. Operations have been to protect private property over to the west, but not at the expense of the public safety or personnel safety. Homes can be rebuilt, lives can. Hopefully, we'll never have this much uh, retarded at Ridgeland as we can. An awful lot of death and destruction happens because people are not prepared. That is a tragedy that comes from chaos. Tanker 454, around the lot, uh, force repeat. 454, go ahead, Tom. Do you feel you'll be able to hit the target that we need? You know, it is devastating. That is the essence of disturbance. I mean, disturbance ecology is about death. If you apply a natural source, a natural process like fire, to a natural system, you're likely to yield a natural result. The ground looks pretty much like a blackened carpet, but it isn't long before you begin seeing things sprouting up. Uh, it's amazing. There's some plants that'll have seeds that'll sit waiting for this opportunity to germinate and throw out another generation. So the trees are dead, of course, after the fire. And they look like solid charcoal, but they're not. It's just the bark that's basically blackened. Beneath that bark, there's fine wood. And now that the tree is defenseless, beetles have a heyday and numbers skyrocket. You know, where are these things coming from? These beetles, you know, that can detect heat for up to 100 miles away and have already honed in on these places and have laid eggs on these trees and their larvae are beginning to develop inside the trees. It's, it's remarkable. I mean, they're talking to us. They're telling us something about what historically occurred. And so I think uh, we're risking a great amount of error when we say that these kinds of stand replacement fires didn't occur in the past and they're catastrophic. Most of these animals travel a great distance to get into these burns. Boreal toads come into these burns by the hundreds, sometimes by the thousands. We're not sure why they're here. It's probably the food, but we don't really know. There is so much to learn about these burned forests. Coming upon a fire-dependent species like the blackback woodpecker is really pretty thrilling. It's apparent that its coloration matches the background of these severely burned trees and is as impressive as looking at a white-tailed ptarmigan in snow or a polar bear against polar ice. I mean, this is a reflection of a long evolutionary history of this bird with that kind of environment. And that's a severely burned forest. It's 
uh, been talked about since the turn of the century. Fire ecologists recognized the benefit for a long time. In the wilderness, we have chosen to not suppress all the fires. And what we've seen out there is it's created this mosaic of uh, different fire patterns from different years. And then what we see over time is that the next fire that starts poses less of a risk because it burns into an old fire scar. You know, the more fire we've had on the landscape, the easier it is to contain these fires. We can use fewer crews because there's lower fuel loadings, lower flame links. If you've got areas that have burned around you in the last 10, 15 years, The newer the fire, say a fire from two years ago, would be just impenetrable by a new fire. There's just, there's nothing to burn. So we have tons of beetle larvae now developing in these dead trees. And this is why these woodpeckers come into the burned forests. The main prey item for these woodpeckers that come in are not the bark beetles that are just beneath the bark, but the wood boring beetles. These burrow deeper into the tree. Uh, while they're in the trees, they can get pretty big, like, uh, you know, an inch long or something like that. I mean, it's, these grubs are fantastic food. The beetle larvae take two to three years to mature, then emerge, and then kind of the game's over. And so the blackback woodpeckers have to find some other place, basically, and that's a severely burned forest. And, and this is the sort of thing that's happened for millennia. I mean, it's nothing unusual. It's nothing that hasn't happened before. Systems change. Trees grow, they age, they die, they burn up. Or you'll have pockets of high severity, then pockets of low severity. And you get a tremendous diversity in the system through that mixed severity kind of fire regime. These burns are a hot spot for butterflies. Some of these burns have three and four times the number of species than an unburned forest. It's pretty amazing. There's a whole suite of biological plays being carried out in this landscape. And you can begin to feel the energy of the early years just after fire. And if you believe disturbance has a role in the natural system, you can't get so freaked out. I've seen a, a lot of people change their minds between the only thing you can really do with a fire is suppress it as quickly as possible to, hey, wait a minute, maybe we can do something different here and kind of herd a fire into some past burns and at the same time concentrate our suppression capabilities down where there are communities and private property. What we've decided to do on any fire start is that you protect what's at risk, but you can allow other parts of the fire to burn as long as they're not doing any harm. And that doesn't mean we don't put dozers on it. It doesn't mean we don't put hand crews on it. It doesn't mean we don't burn out. It just means that we decide to manage it for a benefit. It's not necessarily something you can do everywhere. And in a lot of cases, the appropriate response is very heavy-handed initial attack. We have places where we have huge dollar values in urban interfaces. And in those situations, you're going to take a more aggressive response. But where it's possible to let a fire burn on through, it's a lot cheaper. You expose the firefighters to less risk. And by letting these fires burn, they build big blocks that future fires can run into. This fire scar that's going to be on the landscape, it's going to help our long-term landscape fire mosaic. And I think that's a really exciting prospect. Disturbance is so important for system.
If you don't have this dynamic process going on, this disturbance process, you don't have maintenance of the complete variety of life on Earth. I've seen where you can get on your hands and knees and just crawl around picking them in ashes that are wet enough to be slippery. But once they start coming, they're just lots of mushrooms. You know, you're thinking is probably not good to eat, but they are. There are a lot of them are really really pretty. They're almost mystical. When I think of fire, I think of it in different ways. Some places fire's truly a bad thing, and in other places, fire's doing nothing but good. It's regenerating, it's cleaning things out, it's just continuing processes that have been around for thousands of years. Where you get into deep ashes and you'll find where an elk or a moose has stepped in a foot deep and pulled his foot out, and down in the bottom of that grows a mushroom. But as time goes on and the ground warms up, they begin to show up about everywhere. It's neither good nor bad, it's just our perception. But nature doesn't care. <laughs> it's just another event. You know what I think people really need to know is this. Even in the face of intense fire years, we can see the benefits of fire. out there obviously hopefully we can answer some of your questions what we would like to do is ask you to hold your questions the thing that becomes immediately apparent is how complex this all is because there's a house up every canyon and so many people work hard to look after their homes but unfortunately there are a few that don't all year long, we remind people to make sure they cut back brush from their house and get firewood off of their deck. Then we get to the fire season, and we spend 90% of our resources taking care of just a, a small percentage of the folks who didn't do their work at home. And I think until the system changes, the public at large will be paying their tax dollars and their insurance dollars to bail out people that are in places that are very risky. So, you know, the more you do to protect yourself, the less requirements somebody else has to try to do it for you. You know, a little self-sufficiency goes a long way. We always have a moral dilemma about whose homes we can actually expend resources on, and it's, it's kind of tough to tell somebody, we really can't defend your home. What can you do around your homes to make them more defensible, to make sure we don't need to use a $2,000 an hour hill tanker to keep your home from burning. I mean, this is a taxpayer issue. As a society, it's something I think we need to, to deal with or else it's gonna cost us way too much. Through most of the West, I think we have a long way to go with education. Smokey Bear in general had no subtlety in the message. It was basically wildfires are bad. And certainly the more severe the fire, the more negative the view 
The, the more people feel like this is something wrong, this is something unprecedented, and you see these words in the press. This is something catastrophic. And until Smokey changes his story, I think the public's not going to be coming along. We desperately need a new message because it's so hard on a single incident to tell the public that the fire is good, all the while that they get all the other messages that fire is bad. It's just, we can't continue to do this. It's not going to work for us. We're moving away from the uh, previous strategy and dogma to one of beginning to understand that fire is part of this ecosystem. I mostly think about renewal when I think about fire, you know, and, and fire is just one other disturbance. It's Mother Nature's way of cleaning up and starting over, and there's so many plants and animals that just depend on that renewed forest and not the dense, thick type of forest that a lot of people treasure. We're not going to ever keep it out forever. Fire is natural. And we can either adapt to that with our fire management or we can fight it and lose in the long run. We have in mind the benefits to the forest systems, to the wilderness, to the national forests for decades to come. We're thinking about your grandchildren. So I think we had to begin to appreciate the value of these burned forests. You know, we tend to be a little narrow in our view of what the forests provide. So the complexity of all this is really not that complex. It's part of this landscape, and if you're going to live up here, or anywhere in the West, then it's incumbent upon the individual to understand that and, and learn how to live with it. Because it will not be stopped. Not in its entirety.